So welcome everybody. Great to see you again, EO Cafe. It'll be the last one of the summer, uh, before the summer I should say. Uh, next one will be afterwards. Um, and I, I think it feels that everyone is really waiting for the summer break, doesn't it? I think uh, we're, we were just talking about it. I think after the last year, people are sort of really wanting to get away. And uh, so it, fe it feels a bit holiday. And of course, in some uh, some countries, this is uh, uh, quite a Midsummer's Day. The 24th of June is, is a holiday. So uh, maybe that's part of it as well. Um, before we actually get started, um, there's one important change from, from our side, because uh, as many of you know, it's Natasa who, uh, who operates behind the scenes for the EO Cafe and keeps me in line at least helps me uh, sort me out uh, but Natasha is now taking a few months off after all the efforts last week of Expandio and uh, the Fire Forum and now she's successfully brought Raphael into the world so uh, she, her timing was absolutely perfect um, and uh, so a lot of congratulations to, uh, to Natasha and in consequence Delphine who's also just returned from bringing Astrid into the world um, is taking over the behind the scenes activity so you can see our team has been very busy uh, and working hard to try and bring some new members into the uh, community um, just a reminder of the rules for anyone um, you know microphones off unless uh, I invite you to uh, to, to open it uh, but please you can keep cameras on uh, it's nice to see people and to stay in touch and so that was the uh, the original goal of the uh, the EO Cafe, and please um, put any questions you have into the chat. That allows us to be prepared to know what's uh, what's happening. But I will um, invite you to pose the question yourself, and uh, um, so we'll come to that towards the end. As general format, we'll try to have an, uh, 30 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes of uh, conversation with our with our guest between me and our guest and uh, which you can listen into and then join in later and of course our guest today many of you already know uh, Hans Dufurment who is in charge of the uh, Copernicus land monitoring service in the European Environmental Agency it's the second time that Hans has joined us in two weeks because he was also with us in our special EO cafe a couple of weeks ago when we talked about uh, procurement but uh, let me um, maybe just give the floor to Hans to introduce himself and say a few words about his role in the agency uh, to start with. Hans? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jeff, uh, for the invitation to start with. Uh, so my name is Hans Dufourmont. I'm uh, indeed working at the European Environment Agency. And uh, my role there is to coordinate the delegation agreement that the agency has signed in the early days back in 2014 with DG Grow from the Commission uh, to implement basically two components in the in the program uh, the the most the biggest part is the Copernicus land monitoring service and in particular the pan-european and uh, local components uh, of that service because the global component is dealt with by our colleagues from the joint uh, research center and then the second responsibility we got in that delegation agreement is uh, the cross-service in situ coordination, in situ data that are eagerly needed uh, for um, good work uh, in remote sensing, I would say, uh, training purposes, validation purposes whatsoever. Many, many roles there uh, where we can use the in situ data. Um, the Copernicus activities have become over the years more important as well for the agency up to the point that today uh, they have been included in the strategic planning for the coming years. Uh, one of the things is that uh, we noticed that the collection of uh, data, monitoring data from the member states is uh, in some situations getting more and more difficult. Uh, more expensive. Some countries are even deciding to uh, phase out some of the monitoring networks here and there. So that's getting a much more tedious job to get that done. And uh, it's it's kind of obvious that uh, Earth observation uh, phase phases in into that picture and becomes more and more important. So 
Um, that's why our executive director, together with the senior management team, has really decided to invest a lot in uh, the activities that we are performing and where I'm trying to coordinate uh, for the time being still a rather limited team of people. Uh, we have uh, six people that are paid also through that delegation agreement uh, and which I'm coordinating uh, so that we can get the land monitoring service up and running. Voila, up to that for a short introduction. Okay, so okay. You again. okay. yeah, good. Thanks. The, um, so we're talking today in the context the the new European Space Programme has been launched. There have been a lot of events over the last few days concerning that. Um, it includes the next phase of Copernicus, Copernicus 2.0 it's normally referred to. And a lot of work, I know you've been putting a lot of work into the new delegation agreement or partnership uh, agreements for Copernicus uh, 2.0. Um, the land monitoring service will see quite a few changes, I believe, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, so maybe we can start by, if you can give us a, a perspective on how the land service is expected to, uh, uh, to change and how it will um, evolve over the next uh, um, financial period. Okay, um, I'll try to share my screen for that. Let's see if that works. That's also always a very interesting moment in these virtual events. Does the technology help us <laughs> or does it work against us? I hope you're seeing a screen now, which uh, should be... We see, uh, it. we see it fine, yeah. Okay, that's great. It's uh, more or less readable, I hope, and optimized. Yes, okay, off we go. So, um, my presentation, I've uh, structured this, uh, in fact, in, in two main blocks, I would say, two main parts. Uh, one part that um, focuses a bit on the overall policy context in which the land monitoring service and actually the other core services are uh, working uh, for yeah the past few years and the years to come. So that's part one. And then part two, uh, there I focus uh, into what does that now really mean for the land monitoring service. But before we enter into the policy context, I just wanted to remind there's also a kind of general evolution that we see uh, in, in the land monitoring service in terms of a, an exponential increase of input data that we get available and which now really since the launch of uh, the first Sentinels uh, back in, in 2015 uh, in our case um, really got us to the point where we can uh, effectively uh, start operational services much more than it used to be the case before and uh, getting access to the input imagery has always been a tricky thing in the past but now we are really there we get uh, on a very regular rhythm we get actually we get petabytes of data spit it to the earth uh, on a regular basis and uh, following that there is also a general trend uh, by which the policy DGs in the Commission, they are very eager to see uh, the update frequency of all kinds of information increasing. Uh, and if we look at our portfolio, for instance, um, the, the main flagship product, Green Land Cover, uh, used to have a six-year interval between two updates covering uh, the 39 countries that we're dealing with in Europe. And today we are very close to getting almost daily updated information in the high resolution snow and ice service and a number of steps in between. So that's a general context that obviously uh, continues to evolve quite rapidly and which we have to take into account as well. But let's, let's look into the policy context. And I would say uh, from a policy perspective, uh, there are three uh, absolutely crucial uh, parts there. There's the European Green Deal. Everybody now talks about the European Green Deal, but I can tell you for an agency like ours, which has this environment in its title, 
is it's been really a crucial change in the policy context. We have then the eight environmental action plan from the Commission. There's also the global context of the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And these three together form really the core of the policy context that we are working in. Next to that, there is also initiatives that relate to digitalization in Europe uh, that we uh, also follow very closely and which affect uh, to some extent also the activities in the land monitoring service. I hope I managed now to get to the next slide. And yes, let's uh, see now uh, the first part and I'll try to um, show some examples each time of the various chapters that are in the European Green Deal, which is this uh, crucial policy document these years. And uh, by the way, for those amongst you who would not be aware, um, the Green Deal has been inspired and built upon other important policy documents. Three of them uh, come from a global level, from the IPCC, we have the global warming, warming uh, reports. We have then that famous report as well on uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. And we have a global uh, resources outlook. These were three reports that directly fed into the Green Deal. And there is one report at European level that also fed into the uh, into the Green Deal, and that's our own state and outlook of the environment in Europe report, uh, for which the latest version uh, was, uh, was published in, in uh, 2020. And in fact, uh, I would say coincidence, but this proved to be perfect timing to feed into the European Green Deal as well. If we, uh, if we look at the uh, different domains in the Green Deal and where the land monitoring service could contribute, and we notice that in almost every chapter, whether it's now about climate change, about agriculture, about biodiversity, energy, transport, just name it, there's always somewhere in these um, tangible uh, chapters and objectives in the Green Deal, a place where the land monitoring service can play a role. So let's maybe have a look at that and start with the examples from the climate policy, uh, where the intention from the Commission is really to uh, reduce um, the emission of greenhouse gases uh, in, a, in a very substantial way in order to reach uh, climate ne neutrality by 2050. And that's been shown in a number of graphs. Uh, one of them you see here where the reduction of these grasses by 2050 that we need, uh, need to reach is, is really substantial. So this is quite challenging to get there. And in fact, uh, land cover and land use play an important role in there. And that is one of the reasons why we are um, putting a lot of effort into the development of the follow-up of our green land cover product, the CLC Plus, uh, which is now in production. The backbone part is uh, uh, the production there is fully ongoing. Uh, we should relatively soon get the coverage of the EU27 countries. In the same time, the hybrid database that will serve as a central engine uh, and which is called the CLC core um, and which uses also the Eagle data model is also under development and getting um, close to its uh, finalization of the first version. And then uh, where it really becomes important is the so-called instances, which are tailored uh, products that we intend to derive based uh, on this CLC plus uh, database. So that's, that's really a key product uh, that we will use for uh, some of the most important policies amongst other uh, climate change and the necessary mitigation measures there. Let's have a quick look at biodiversity policy there as well. Uh, the situation is quite alarming. Uh, it's, it's, it gets less public attention maybe as compared to climate change. Uh, but nevertheless, the impact of the loss of biodiversity across the globe and also in Europe is so substantial 
uh, that it risks to become a quite a catastrophic situation. And in fact, we have been uh, working already a bit on these uh, uh, topics. Uh, for instance, with our Natura 2000 product, uh, which was uh, meant to map in various timestamps the land cover and land use over the designated Natura 2000 sites. And you see here an example of uh, the use case that was made and um, where it was uh, shown that the legislation on the Natura 2000 sites is actually capable of preserving a better biodiversity. In the left lower chart, you see uh, the changes that happened from left side land cover class to right side land cover, another land cover class. So all these changes in these areas and in the buffer zones around. What is important is actually the upper uh, graph where you see two lines. Uh, the upper one is, is showing you uh, the, the ratio between the, the so-called hard types of land cover versus the so-called soft types of land cover. Soft ones being the ones that are um, better suited to preserve biodiversity. And in the second bar, you see the same kind of uh, ratio between the hard classes and the soft classes. But you notice that there, uh, without the legislation in place outside these sites, the hard types of land cover land use are um, getting more dominating as compared to inside the N2K, which clearly shows that European legislation at that level works. And that analysis, that assessment has been done on the land monitoring Natura 2000 product. So uh, these things are really quite important uh, to underpin these European policies. Let's have a look at agriculture policy. There as well, um, uh, we still have a system with the uh, existing cap where, uh, where unfortunately the agriculture practice is quite unsustainable and still uh, forms a major threat to the natural capital and the biodiversity in Europe. So we have to do something about that. And we're quite happy to see that in the new version of the cup, uh, there are this so-called good agro-environmental conditions that have been introduced in the system and where uh, the member states have to monitor these good agro-environmental conditions. In order to be able to do that, here again, the Land Monitoring Service can contribute in a substantial way. This is a picture of a superposition of the high resolution layers on land cover characteristics as we have them today. And uh, recently we launched a call for tender for the next update of these high resolution layers on vegetated land cover characteristics and a very important part in there uh, concerns the crop types which we need to fill out the major white spaces that we still had in the uh, ex in the previously already existing high resolution layers on imperviousness forest grasslands wetness and water so uh, this is a tool that will also help uh, underpinning uh, the new cup, but it's not the only one. We have actually also in the portfolio something that will be launched um, in the autumn of this year is the high resolution uh, vegetation phenology and productivity product. And that's, uh, that's the type of product where uh, for the first time we start using um, intensively the intra-seasonal time series of Sentinel-2 data and which will allow us to uh, to do many types of assessments on, uh, for instance, on uh, estimating biomass, uh, but also like here in the example, an assessment of ecosystem response, response to drought over time uh, and uh, other things like, uh, for instance, also uh, mowing cycles that we will be able to identify mowing cycles in grassland. Um, that should link us with um, an indicator on intensity of management practices over the grassland. So there's a lot of applications possible uh, with the introduction of uh, high resolution vegetation technology and productivity. And it adds up to the other products that we have, uh, which will further help us 
improve the accuracy also of the uh, land cover mapping that we are doing, for instance, in the in the backbone of CLC Plus. So that's also a tool that is at our disposition uh, very soon now for uh, monitoring the gap. I talked already about the good agroecological conditions. The third product that we have in that uh, in that series uh, concerns the small woody features, of which you see an example here. We had a first run on the reference year 2015. The production now on the reference year 2018 is ongoing. And the idea there is also that we start monitoring in a more systematic way the presence of small woody features, hedgerows, rows of trees, isolated trees, stuff like that. But not only that, DG Agri already asked to extend that to other small landscape features like uh, tiny little ponds, stone walls, buffer strips, um, any kind of uh, landscape element that is kind of uh, integrated in the agricultural area and which, um, whereas the uh, agricultural area sensu stricto uh, focuses on the production part of the agricultural activities. These tiny little elements then focus much more on preserving biodiversity. The question there, of course, is uh, what do you do with monitoring these small woody features and landscape features? It's nice to be able to identify them, but when it comes then to in interpreting these small landscape features, how should we do that? Is it, for instance, is it really um, a, a disadvantage, just to give you an example from France, that in the Normandy region, uh, you have a, a very high density of these uh, hedgerows, which is considered normally quite advantageous in terms of biodiversity. Is it then a disadvantage to notice that in another region, like in the Champagne area, where you have uh, massive uh, fields of uh, uh, arable land without any or very uh, little hedgerows and the rows of trees, is that a disadvantage or do we have a completely other uh, ecosystem there and should we take it uh, into account in a different way? So there's a lot of questions still to be answered when it comes to uh, how can we now best use these products so that it really starts underpinning uh, the Green Deal in the best possible way. That, uh, as, a few, as just a few examples on uh, on uh, the agriculture policy. To move on, water and soil policy, uh, there as well, uh, we still have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, we still notice that there's quite an intensive uh, level of uh, um, pollution into the water system uh, based on the reporting we get from the member states in the uh, water framework directive. And so, uh, the question there is as well, to which extent can the land monitoring service of Copernicus contribute to providing and monitoring information that uh, gives us a better grip on uh, the, the reality in the field uh, when it comes to water? We have already several products. We have the high resolution layer wetness and, and uh, water. We have the EU hydro reference data set, but the idea now is to extend uh, these products also with a dimension of water quality, uh, mainly on algae blooming and uh, turbidity to start with, and we'll further explore other possibilities as well. And uh, we will try to include that into the uh, water-related products so that uh, we can support also these aspects of European policy. A bit the same with snow and ice and uh, in line also what, uh, with what happened now with the recent publication of the high resolution layer um, vegetated land cover characteristics. The idea is to start combining as well uh, other high resolution layers, wetness and water, combining with, for instance, the high resolution snow and ice uh, products or at least parts thereof. So that's something that we have in uh, coming as well. And uh, I didn't mention so far the global dimension, but I think it goes without saying that uh, we have to make sure that uh, the products that we are producing at European level uh, also become highly useful at a global level. So harmonization with global products in the same domain uh, from the Copernicus program is definitely something we have in our agenda as well.
urban and regional policy. Um, yeah, uh, when we know how many uh, percent of the population is uh, globally living in cities, then uh, it's uh, quite clear that monitoring the urban environment uh, is, is very important, in particular knowing that it's uh, uh, the artificial surfaces that are increasing all the time. Uh, and so um, encroaching into the more natural parts of these uh, urban environments. And yet we as human beings, uh, we, we have difficulties surviving without uh, sufficient uh, natural elements. So we need to closely monitor what is happening at that level as well. We have there an urban atlas product that we will continue to use uh, over the coming years and probably increase the update frequency of the product as well, and uh, which helps us uh, building several types of indicators again by combining it with other data sets and trying to support as good as it gets uh, the implementation of various European policies. There's a Another product that I would like to mention very quickly, but which hasn't uh, hasn't uh, reached its publication yet, it concerns the European Ground Motion Service, a new product in the portfolio, but will which will definitely also contribute uh, to certain uh, problem statements in. Uh, European areas of various kinds, actually, mostly in built up areas, but also uh, with landslides and stuff like that in more natural areas as well. So uh, portfolio is, is really uh, increasing quite a bit. Another example comes from the coastal zone, where we have the challenge to uh, find the balance between sustainable growth of a maritime economy, um, implementation of environmental legislation, and then ensuring that everything gets uh, quickly well managed, uh, um, firmly well managed in integrated uh, coastal zone management. Quite a challenge. Uh, we need for that, we need a, a relevant and reliable geospatial reference database. We need to have information on vulnerability of the coastal ecosystems. Uh, ecosystem and habitat mapping are equally important in the light of the EU biodiversity strategy and as well the pressure coming from inland water on the, on the coastal uh, waters is an important element that plays a role. Luckily, we do have several products that are already dealing with that. So we will continue working on uh, these products and improving them further over the coming years. In conclusion, I think it's fair for that first part to say that there's a lot of products uh, from the various court services, not only the land monitoring service, but a lot of products that can contribute to priorities in the European Green Deal. But let's now have a quick look also into part two in the perspectives that we have for the coming years, 21, 27, and the context thereof. Um, for those of you who have read the EU space um, program regulation, uh, I highlighted here a few words in red from the preambles of that regulation. Ensure continuity is definitely something that the Commission has uh, put high on the agenda. There's nothing as bad as an interruption in the continuity of monitoring information, uh, monitoring data, and uh, being able to extract information from it uh, to underpin the policies. Obviously, we need to stay at the cutting edge of new technologies and trends. Um, and uh, in there, it almost goes without saying that the coming years we'll see a major shift towards uh, big data analytics and the use of artificial intelligence. So everything is actually said there in a few year, uh, words to see in which direction we will evolve. If we look at uh, Article 54 in that regulation that deals specifically with the Copernicus services, then it becomes pretty clear that uh, whereas in the previous regulation we had actually we had six individual core services, now these are being brought together 
and um, there's a clear focus and intention from the Commission uh, to put a lot more accent on the horizontal cross-service cooperation between mainly in the first part, I would say, the atmosphere, uh, marine, land and climate change service in order to be able to cope with the very challenging uh, demands that we get in a broad environment and climate change context. So, so that will definitely be an important focus for the coming years. And if we try to translate that into some strategic objectives for the CLMS, then I would say uh, ensuring the continuity uh, in provision of continuous, reliable and timely and fit for purpose uh, information is definitely a, a first important strategic objective, but it should also become a key instrument uh, to underpin the policies. If we want the, uh, to uh, guarantee the long-term sustainability of the Copernicus services, then the only way forward, I would say, is that uh, uh, decision makers and uh, policy people that they see the tangible benefits that come from these services uh, in helping them underpinning uh, any kind of policy initiative they want to make. So that's quite important uh, as a second objective. And then, of course, um, this cross-service uh, horizontal cooperation is definitely also a very important part. Translating that further into more tangible challenges that we face, um, there's, there's a lot here uh, for us to move towards the near real-time provision of multi-purpose baseline data. We have to ensure the long-term sustainability of the data. We have to improve the timeliness. That's, timeliness has really been all the years already quite a painful point, I must say, and where we need to further improve. Harmonization is something that more recently emerged um, when people started looking into the differences between mainly the global component in the land monitoring service and the pan-European component. So there's a lot of work there to be done with the colleagues of the Joint Research Center to harmonize uh, our products. And then, of course, make sure that, um, the, uh, that the users a broad range of users, not only the thematic DGs in the Commission, but also national authorities dealing with environment and climate change, uh, industry uh, to build downstream services, uh, individuals, non-governmental organizations, everybody who would need access to the data needs to uh, get easily access to these data and, of course, uh, be able to trust the data that it's really uh, well quality control and validated. So these are some of the challenges ahead for us. I will not um, uh, go into the detail of this slide in the, in the interest of time, uh, but I guess, uh, Jeff, they will be distributed afterwards uh, so that, uh, yeah, that they are available to the audience. Uh, but to look a bit into um, into what is coming to us, I would say we have uh, we have uh, the certitude of ensuring the continuity, but looking at what uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton uh, said at the European Space Conference in the beginning uh, of the year, and which he actually repeated now just a few days ago at the official launch of the EU um, uh, space program, is that nothing is going to stay the same as it was. Eh? So also in Copernicus, we'll have to adapt uh, uh, to, we cannot continue business as usual. Uh, we have to adapt to the new um, uh, and innovative approaches that are appearing out there. And so that's one of the accents he wants, uh, he definitely wants to put um, into our activities and where we will have to react in a flexible way. Concrete now, what, it, what does it mean? And again, it's not the idea that we go through every single element here. Uh, since the slides will be available afterwards, you, you have the opportunity to read uh, through these uh, detailed aspects. But let's say in um, uh, categories of actions, we have, uh, we have first and foremost continuity, ensuring the continuity of the service. And there we have the five categories of which I gave uh, examples in the first part of the talk. Uh, so
also continuity of service is there important. Second element that we are elaborating in the contribution agreement, as it will be called from now on, it will no longer be a delegation agreement, but a contribution agreement uh, with TGDEF is. So the second um, focus is on extensions of the portfolio, and that is mainly about uh, improving the products, uh, creating kind of enhanced products like uh, with the CLC Plus or the Urban Atlas, changing from six years to three years, or in the Natura 2000, instead of a subset of Natura 2000 sites, maybe the full set, but then probably the money will not be there uh, to continue including the buffers around the Natura 2000 sites. So these are things that are under discussion with uh, DEFIS and DGN. Coastal zones, we would love to continue working on the dynamic aspects of the coastal zones. And actually, there's a lot of push from the Mediterranean countries uh, to do that in cooperation with our colleagues from the uh, CMEMS, the Marine Environment Service. Uh, also, the request from Agri to move from small woody features to small landscape features, so making it much more broader. Is uh, These are all examples of how we consider extensions to the portfolio or uh, call it improvements of the portfolio, if you like. Uh, at the same time, uh, DG Defis has been quite pushy on trying um, to get things uh, further optimized. Uh, whenever there are uh, potential overlap, overlaps in production processes, they really want to uh, get rid of that and say, okay, you need to have one uh, common basis and then everything that needs to use that coming common basis can use the same common basis instead of copy uh, repeating the same exercise in every single contract. So that's why, for instance, we have been merging uh, some of the high resolution layers and why you now got this call on uh, vegetated land cover characteristics. The next one will follow later on this year on non-vegetated land cover characteristics and then a third one where we merge uh, wetness, water and snow and ice. So this is the second um, main line, I would say, of what is to come uh, over the coming years. Of course, we need to look into service evolution further automation towards near real-time information extraction. Uh, I think we will, in the coming seven years, we will see a substantial move from uh, more traditional status and change maps towards uh, an approach with continuous monitoring of uh, the environment. So so that's uh, that's definitely uh, also quite, uh, quite an important element uh, for the coming years. Uh, but if we do that, uh, we're also aware that this, this cannot be done, given the huge amount of data, this cannot be done with the traditional techniques. And so we also have to move into artificial uh, intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, uh, into the workflows of the CLMS production, which then has other challenges in ensuring that uh, what you measure is still sufficiently the same. Uh, to have this continuity in the information that you get out of it. So all of that uh, are elements of uh, service evolution. I would say it goes without saying that we start forgetting more and more about the standalone uh, small environments of production, but really moving into uh, cloud-based environments, and in particular then uh, the Vakeo Diaz, uh, for which our agency is joining uh, the partnership there together with ECMWF, Mercator Rossio International, and UMITSA. So that's a third line of thinking in the contribution agreement. Lines four and five are uh, quite obvious, I would say. Um, uh, the Commission, in order to improve the accessibility of all the products available across the services, is thinking about setting up what they call uh, to, yeah, sorry, I, I still noticed right now that I still have an error in the terminology here. It still uh, says knowledge hubs. It should be thematic hubs. Yeah? Thematic hubs meaning that people who are interested in biodiversity can have a single point of access and immediately then get guided to all the products and services that deal with that specific topic. So these thematic hubs is certainly something uh, for which our, our agency has uh, shown interest, in particular 
biodiversity probably as well on water probably as well on urban and spatial planning still to be decided with uh, dg defis user management customer care we're very happy that we get now an explicit part on that we didn't have that in our delegation agreement 2014 2020 unfortunately uh, this time around we will definitely have uh, all these aspects included in the contribution agreement so we will be working on that one as well and then we have um, yeah product and service dissemination uh, the maintenance of the portal um, and uh, the connectivity with the KODS and how that uh, how that gets connected in the best possible way uh, with each uh, of these entries its uh, specificity that uh, that makes them interesting to go either this way or that way product management and archiving that's then more I would say good practice uh, for long-term maintenance uh, whenever reanalysis would be needed at a certain point that we are still uh, sure that we have access to all these previous versions. And with that, I think I've, I can come to, uh, to the end of the presentation part. And uh, luckily, we still have some time for questions and discussion. Thank you very much so far. Thank you very much, Hans. That was uh, was 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 really complete. Um, we 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 have some time. Um, you've answered a lot of my questions, a lot of the things I was going to uh, discuss with you, but uh, you've raised uh, quite a few others. Um, just first, uh, uh, maybe a, a slightly general question, because uh, I mean, um, the industry is very keen to work in the uh, provision of the Copernicus services and working with the agency, your agency has always uh, been very, very effective. Um, with all these new um, initiatives going on, new uh, developments, do you see any change in that uh, practice of working with, with industry? Um, I, I don't see, uh, l l let me first say that um, in our agency, what, what we consider very important is the balance that we found uh, between working together with the industry for uh, most of the production parts and at the same time also working to, together with the public authorities in the member states who are dealing with the uh, topics related to land monitoring. I think this is a very fruitful type of uh, connection that we found there where we have a relative, uh, relative good balance. Uh, so we definitely want to continue maintaining that balance and we definitely are keen in continuing a good cooperation with the industry and with the uh, member states in the setup, in the overall setup of mm -hmm. the land monitoring service. Does that mean that nothing change uh, would change? No, definitely not. And there will be things that uh, will change. And um, uh, one of the things that might change and which I would personally really like to introduce uh, and, and which we discussed also in the previous uh, special EO Cafe on uh, on procurement is this uh, competitive dialogue uh, process uh, when it comes to kind of cutting edge developments that we need to implement uh, and, and where we would need to, uh, to to organize it in such a way that at the same time we do not bias um, the uh, uh, market situation but still create an opportunity for uh, more hard uh, competition on certain elements uh, mm -hmm. that are cutting edge in terms of development. So that's definitely something mm -hmm. I would, I will push my colleagues from the procurement service to really start dive, diving into these aspects. But in general, I would say we definitely uh, want to continue having a good relationship uh, with the industry. And yeah. we, talk, we talked also about uh, pre-competitive procurement as a possible tool, yes. so uh, that, could, yeah. that could follow on from uh, you know, this, this notion of competitive dialogue or bring a more research-oriented uh, edge to it, which I think you know, industry would be very, very uh, interested to, um, to, to develop. Uh, yeah. One of the things that uh, we're very keen to see is, mu is much more um, policy-led and links to, um, to policies, so the fact that Many of the services coming out from Copernicus now can really help policy, both in the design of better policy and the um, the, the control, the monitoring and control of uh, of policies. And I take as an example one you've you flagged up, the Water Framework uh, Directive, 
which um, uh, as I understand is is not being uh, reviewed at this stage it uh, it was um, report it reports every six years so it was reported on uh, not so long ago and there is no uh, further review of it so the next opportunity to use EO in formally in the water framework directive would not be to around 2030 or, or, or beyond even on the other hand you through the Copernicus side you're introducing the water quality monitoring service and which it, it, I find it really interesting because it's essentially technology led coming from the member states it's the Copernicus group saying you know we can we can do this we want to do this and show our colleagues in the environment uh, ministries uh, you know how we can contribute to, to water quality management so um, we would be interested again to see much more activity in uh, helping to introduce EO into policies, uh -huh. which I think uh, again is an area that we can probably tackle, you know, together or support you in uh, in in doing. Uh -huh. Well, definitely, and it, it's absolutely something that uh, we will also uh, push forward as much as we can. Um, I think we have here a, um, a very unique window of opportunity between, from one side, what is becoming possible with the Sentinel family of satellites and the, the, the enormous volume of data that we get in the ground stations uh, and that uh, require us actually to adapt also in our uh, interpretation uh, algorithms uh, to, to uh, apply uh, innovative techniques of various kinds. So there's, from one side, there is this opportunity that now is finally, after, let's say, after 40, 50 years of development in satellite EO, where always it was promised, yes, we, we become operational, but in practice, very often it was limited to single use cases. Now we get there from a technology perspective, one part. The other part is really this European Green Deal. I don't think we will get a second opportunity from the policy perspective where uh, the environment related and climate change related questions are so top level on the agenda as it is now under this commission and where obviously since say roughly almost 100% of the population is living on land, land as a resource is so critical uh, we, it, it's really the two together that that offers this unique opportunity to say, come on, guys, we're going to do it. And we're going to show that it works. We're going to create these continuous monitoring mechanisms and convince you with factual, reliable information about the status of uh, all these indicators that we can derive from remote sensing data and which uh, which definitely will help underpinning uh, the policies. And so even in the water framework directive, I think that uh, if we if we start um, implementing uh, these new techniques or extension of our products towards water quality, for instance, uh, over the coming years, it will sh it, it will show uh, how things are changing and it will definitely also end up on the table of the policy makers uh, and, and that's how it could trigger at some point maybe an acceleration in a revision of a yeah. piece of legislation. Yeah. Uh, there, there's this interaction between the two all the time. It, it would be good to have a, a, a good win there. I mean we, we, we all I think quote the, uh, the, the, the cap and the evolution of the cap now to, uh, to make better use of EO data. Uh, hmm. To have uh, another success, I, and the, the bathing water directive maybe uh, maybe also another one to think of hmm. before the water framework directive because that that is that is under under review. Um, um, yeah, you, I have to I have to pick you up on this because you mentioned a lot in there about the use of Wekio and uh, you know working with, with Wekio. Why Wekio? Why, why yeah. not um, one of the other DS? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, there's, there's actually there's a, there's a number of reasons. 
Uh, but if if you allow me to limit to just a few uh, major arguments that uh, plays a role uh, to choose for WKO, which does not mean that we do not support the other deals. Uh, our let let me be very clear: all of the CLMS data remain fully accessible and usable. Uh, by the other DSs as well, and if we get questions there on certain technicalities, we will definitely continue replying to that. So that's that's not a problem. But it's true we have chosen a, a partnership agreement with Vikeo, um, uh, basically uh, because we consider uh, Vikeo also as um, a, a very tangible. Uh, facilitating mechanism for the cooperation that the Commission has put forward in the um, uh, space program regulation concerning what I mentioned this cross service horizontal cooperation in a broad environment and climate change domain now you know as as it so happens atmosphere service ECMWF uh, climate change service ECMWF Marine Environment Service, Mercator Ocean. That's already three out of four environmental and climate change related services. And the land monitoring service was in a way was the missing link there uh, to, to make the picture complete and say, okay, there we have the four services uh, together uh, in, in, uh, in one setting in this uh, Vikeo Diaz. Uh, that allows us and will facilitate uh, a further and deeper cooperation between these interested entities. So that's definitely an element that has played an important role. Mm. Uh, there's a second element that I would like uh, to mention um, here as well, and which um, emerged when, when we started looking into the various DSS quite some time ago, meanwhile, uh, is the fact that uh, the Wikeo Diaz was the one that right from the outset, really from the very early ideas and, and conceptual development, it has been set up as a, a distributed architecture because it involved already right from the outset these four interested entities, the fourth one being UMETSAT. Uh, um, and the distributed architecture is now exactly in a way uh, a replica of how our agency is functioning with all the environmental agencies in the member states. Uh, so we are also um, uh, existing thanks to uh, an, a good cooperation with all these national um, environmental agencies or environment ministries. And um, we are also in that uh, context moving uh, in, into a complete digital version of our distributed network, the EI net network. So having uh, there the DIAS for the Copernicus-related activities that right from the outset focuses on this distributed uh, setup, which eases a lot hooking up national entities into such a setting, has been the second uh, important uh, element to decide uh, for Wikio, and there are a few more, but okay. Uh, I, mean, we can... I, I, I think I can I can see the logic of it. I think it's a subject that we'll probably uh, probably come back to because I I, I see uh, a, lo a lot of issues there. But let me um, let me bring in uh, some of the uh, the other guests. Uh, so Je Jeff Smith, Jeff. Hi Hans. Uh, Hi, thanks very much for that uh, good overview presentation, and also for featuring one of the pubs from my local area in yeah, my youth. I was going to say that. <laughs> I was going to say that. Yeah. So yeah, it's so famous. It's got coal, old coal mines underneath, and the the pub is collapsing because of them. But that, that was great. I will promote that in my local area to say how great uh, uh, the Copernicus Land Monitoring Services. Uh, but yeah, my question was about uh, the sort of candidate missions coming along. And I wondered if uh, the CLMS is already considering how those missions could either uh, complement or maybe expand the portfolio uh, in the in the coming, you know, slightly longer time frame. Um, yes, we start reflecting upon that, and and that happens actually in uh, in cooperation with uh, the Commission and uh, uh, mainly with ESA. Um, there are. There are very first uh, discussions or talks that have been started on 
uh, Sentinel Next Generation, in particular on the way forward with uh, Sentinel-2, which is our main working horse uh, for the time being in land monitoring and where a number of questions are on the table. Uh, choices, technological choices also that need to be made, made at a certain point and uh, where we are voicing also uh, a position from the land monitoring perspective. Questions that relate, for instance, to choices of resolution. Uh, you, you may know that uh, there are uh, ideas circulating to go from 10 meter to 5 meter down to 2 meter and a half. Uh, is, is it really needed in the next generation Sentinel-2 uh, or does that, for instance, would that again create a disruption for a number of land monitoring pro uh, products as we have seen with the transition from 20 meter uh, contributing mission data to the 10 meter today in Sentinel-2 where um, the continuity and the reliability of the imperviousness product is creating a bit of headache uh, to intercalibrate things again in, a, in the most uh, correct way so that we can ensure the long-term continuity of the information that is extracted from such products. So, um, in other words, I mean, we, we, we're, we're a little bit uh, maybe even playing the advocate of the devil uh, in a sense that we are sometimes uh, challenging these questions that are coming from ESA from a technological side. Uh, and, and, and for instance, asking questions, yeah, okay, what is now better? Is it now better to uh, further reduce uh, the spatial resolution or should we focus on an extra uh, copy of the satellite which would increase the temporal uh, frequency, things like that. And these questions are in an early phase of uh, discussion with ESA, in particular for Sentinel-2 for the moment. Uh, there is obviously, uh, we're looking with great interest also on some of the other missions uh, that have been decided as high priority missions, but then mostly uh, looking into the cooperation with the other services, for instance, on the uh, CO2 mission uh, or also on the thermal infrared, on the hyperspectral. Uh, these are things that, um, that keep our attention uh, going, really. And then uh, a more tangible aspect of looking forward uh, happens also in the VHR domain, uh, where the question is now on the table whether or not to move to yearly updates of a full coverage of the pan-European area. Uh, that's mainly an issue of capacity still, I would say, in that domain, even though there are, um, as you know, there are uh, with the micro satellites, there are solutions available today uh, to get more regular coverages over the pan-European continent, but then there are also geopolitical concerns that start playing outside our field of discussion with the Commission, but which we happen to know that DGDEF is looking into uh, more carefully and which is also of concern uh, for ESA who has to manage uh, uh, these kinds of uh, evolutions in, in the VHR domain. So yes, all in all, we are looking into it. Uh, we are contributing to it. We're not playing a main role, but we are contributing uh, whenever we get the request from either DG DEFIS or, uh, or ESA or both of them. So you, you, you mentioned their continuity and uh, maintaining continuity, which also links very nicely to the next question from Regina. Regina? Yeah, um, th first, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting and very comprehensive. Um, just in more like, general terms as it comes to mechanism, as, as it comes to how to ensure that Copernicus services reflect what the industry can deliver, how to ensure this continuity and operationality, uh, but bringing innovations also on board to Copernicus. What is the mechanism right now to you know, yeah. test, test and ensure that, you know, the best, uh, the Copernicus uh, serves the best it can. Yeah. Um, well, to reply to that, I, I will reply in with two threads. Uh, I, I would say we have a kind of ideal vision on that one. Mm -hmm. And then we have the reality. Yeah. Uh, the ideal vision that, that we have on that one uh, and in our team, in our land monitoring team, 
we consider um, that this would typically be a role where we should be able to call upon the support from the Joint Research Center. They have the brains, they have the capacity, they have the expertise to help us out on the short term, uh, really uh, exchanging letters in a way should almost be sufficient to start a short term action on answering a very specific question with regard to can something change in approach uh, whilst not breaking the continuity or not. Yeah. This is uh, th this would be an ideal uh, mechanism, because the other mechanisms that we have today is uh, calling upon the projects from the horizon type of programs. But there we know that there's an enormous time lag between uh, uh, identifying the topics of a call, organizing the call, selecting the projects, running the projects until you come to a result that then can be operationally implemented way too late yeah so these are more for the major uh, developments to come and and the kind of uh, crystal ball looking activities i would say uh, with regard to the service but on the short term we should ideally be able to call upon the colleagues from joint research center in practice this is not always the case yeah it's uh, for all kinds of practical reasons it doesn't always uh, run the way we would ideally ideally like it so the reality today is that the process that we are using uh, uh, to uh, to find this optimal combination between ensuring continuity and introducing innovation is uh, working with consultation processes and that's something that we will do more and more uh, consultation processes prior to consulting uh, the market on ideas that we have and uh, uh, for which we uh, put forward, for instance, a technical document uh, with the help uh, from either EINET or the Eagle Group or in-house uh, experts, and then uh, bounce that to the broader uh, land monitoring um, community in a consultation process. That's something that we will use more than we have been doing in the past, and which should allow us to introduce uh, novelties, uh, of which we then still have to check to which extent it is sufficiently mature to be rolled out at an operational level. And because we, we can actually, I mean, we have had, unfortunately, uh, and luckily not so much, but we have had one or two cases in the past where we got promises, this and that is possible, until we then got confronted with reality and it didn't work. And then, of course, we are in trouble. And because our main task as an agency, and maybe it's good to underline that as well, our main task as an agency is to roll out operational services. I will even exaggerate a little bit if I say, but there's a large extent of truth in it, if I say that we're not even supposed to work on the pure research and the development part of things. Yeah, we are really supposed to do all the operational implementations. Of course, separating both is very difficult. We all know that. Huh? And, and we all know also that it's extremely difficult to bridge between the pure R&D towards uh, a truly operational service. Uh, there, there are steps in between there, prototyping, whatever you want to call it, that are needed um, to, to make sure that sufficient testing can be done before we enter really into full operational services. So uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a tricky part in the trajectory where we always have to be very careful uh, not to be attacked actually by uh, colleagues from the research world uh, in GRC who are claiming that we are encroaching then in their domain. It's it's not easy going. But consultation is for us, let's say that's that's the that's the mechanism where we have uh, quite some trust, good experience as well, good feedback coming from a broad range of stakeholders and offering also opportunity to 
yeah, to basically any kind of stakeholder to contribute and uh, suggesting novelties, which we then can further elaborate. Well, as, you, as you know, we're we're really keen to uh, to work with you on that. Um, we've we've overrun the time already, but there are still some questions. Are you okay to to keep going for a bit? Yeah, um, I, I have time. I, uh, I expect time I expect some people will drop out, but uh, it's. Um, uh, I think we can we can continue. Michael uh, Michael Spichovitz, um also has a question about uh, oper operationalization. Michael. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Michał Spichowicz from DigiDefi's uh, Space Strategy, and one of issues I'm interested in is exactly mainstreaming of uh, space data services and applications. Uh, it was uh, really very interesting, Hans, to, to hear what you uh, has just said. What is interesting for me, uh, uh, your products or your research or whatever you offer currently, uh, uh, how much time would it need, or maybe this is already useful, that, uh, that regions or um, environmental authorities, water authorities, forest authorities, uh, cities, as a chair, could start to help themselves uh, with your services to to better go against the green objectives. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, well, to to answer that uh, question, Michael, actually, as we are speaking, uh, this is to a certain extent already happening because. Uh, I, I told that we have several components in the land monitoring. We have the global component, the pan-European component, and then the local hotspot monitoring component. Now, uh, in that hotspot monitoring component, we are moving to uh, certain priority areas, I would call them, priority areas with specific problems, like uh, larger urban zones, the functional urban areas, that uh, DG Radio has defined uh, together with the OECD. Um, and we have uh, products there that uh, provide already uh, much better resolution than, uh, than what we have in the pan-European products. So in the pan-European products, we're mainly building upon Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2. Uh, so in a resolution range, uh, say now uh, down to 10 meter, but in, with the VHR data, very high resolution data, we go uh, down to uh, around two meter resolution in products like the Urban Atlas or uh, Natura 2000, uh, riparian zones, coastal zones. So it's, it's actually already happening. And uh, it will, over the coming years, there's little doubt about that, it will further go into more detail as uh, Technologically, uh, we get even uh, even finer resolutions available from uh, from the observation satellites. Um, will it will it uh, be useful for regions for cities? Uh, yes, provided that people are willing to adapt workflows, because very often, uh, if uh, cities or regions are not yet uh, using uh, land monitoring or other Copernicus products, uh, then it has to do with established workflows that they have, which are quite often based on the in situ data alone and not so much on of observation data. And um, as you may know with the Earth observation data, we don't exactly provide exactly the same type of information as one collects in detail on the ground. It's very often, it's a proxy type of information that we can provide, but with the advantage that we can, that we have this synoptic overview that we can uh, get much quicker into uh, updates of the information and so on and so forth. So, um, so it needs an adaptation of the workflow uh, to convince people uh, to start working uh, with these uh, Copernicus products and for that I think it's very important that we start investing and that's why I'm also so happy that we get that opportunity that we start investing in user uptake activities whereby we will be able to show with tangible use cases how a certain traditional workflow can be either complemented or accelerated or improved 
or replaced even in some cases by a traditional workflow. And, and that process is really a process of um, yeah, spreading the word with, uh, with convincing examples, but one has to be able then to really provide the examples, to gather that, to, yeah, to spread the word on it. But it is already happening to a certain extent. Okay, so we've got um, two more questions um, which I'll, I'll take and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll finish. So Se Stefan Jozovic um, is also wanting about uh, the interested in the high resolution level that you mentioned earlier, filling in on crop types. So I think that's the question. Stefan. Uh, yeah, precisely. Uh, Jeff, you got it. Um, we are a precision agriculture company and uh, I was wondering when that high resolution layer will become available because it's of major interest to the entire industry, I, I bet. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Okay. Uh, well, the, the call has been published. Um, so uh, the closure is, uh, I don't, don't remember by heart, but uh, towards the end of the summer period and then follows the evaluation uh, period of the tenders that we will get, hopefully. And then, uh, then it's a matter of establishing the framework contracts. And from the moment we have this framework contract in place, from that moment onwards, one I calculate that roughly within one year from then, uh, we should start seeing results in an in an operational uh, way, and and from there onwards. Uh, rep repeated every single year and uh, we should really get into a continuous flow then of uh, of the crop monitoring product yeah so so tangibly uh, to put a date on it if we get uh, if we get a framework contract signed say uh, late autumn this year then i uh, then i hope and trust that by the end of 22 uh, this whole cycle of continuous monitoring and providing crop information uh, will be on the rails. Okay. And then uh, Pascal Seashore is uh, looking at not so much the uh, spatial uh, frequency, but the update frequency of the uh, of the pan-European coverage. Pascal. Yeah, thanks, Geoff. Actually, it's both. So uh, once I ask you, Hans, in an ideal world, um, what would you like to have from a frequency in the VHR uh, pan-European coverage in terms of frequency and in terms of resolution? And then your answer was two times a year, two meter. Um, and I wanted to ask you if, if this has changed over the years now um, and if you foresee any new frequency that uh, the pan-European coverage is going to be re released. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's indeed uh, an answer from quite some time ago. Eh? <laughs> but uh, but yes, things are uh, changing rapidly. Technology is also changing rapidly, and uh, and and the fact that we get into a position now to start analyzing intra-seasonal time series of Sentinel uh, two data uh, really is a is a game changer. Eh? So uh, it, it means that for a lot of products, um, the request is there to uh, to further increase. Uh, there's two things: uh, further increase the update frequency and come to yearly updates, for instance, yeah, uh, of the information products. And I'm not talking the imagery, but the information products. Uh, the other thread is that uh, there is this trend to start looking into continuous monitoring. So forget about status and change. This may still become a derived product then, but we do uh, continuous monitoring across time. And that, that is the second thread uh, which we are looking into. What I see personally still as a problem to go um, to in the first thread, to go to yearly updates for a number of products is the fact that uh, we are, we are playing uh, very closely now between the level of accuracy that can be reached in the products uh, and the real change in the terrain. And of course, if, uh, if the error margin is, is still starts being bigger than, than the change that we uh, can measure, 
then we have a problem there. So we shouldn't make that mistake. Uh, this is why not every product will uh, automatically switch to yearly updates, but that we will carefully look into those situations where it makes sense to do it versus those where it's not really, uh, it, where it starts being counterproductive almost uh, to try to do it. And, and that's then also the point where we have to uh, maybe change tactics and say, okay, this is the point in time where uh, a major step towards continuous monitoring uh, is at stake here. Yeah? Uh, so maybe let's forget about the status mapping and switch to that continuous monitoring. Work in progress, and that's, that's definitely something on our table for the coming two years, I would say, to, uh, to investigate into that, uh, uh, do some assessments of various kinds, and then take uh, the necessary decisions so that towards the second half of the coming uh, period, 21-27, uh, that we can start really shifting towards this uh, continuous monitoring for a number of products. Hmm. That, would be, uh, that would be really exciting. Um, Hans, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think you've given us a, a real lot to, lot of to think about, and uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, the slides, um, I think you said earlier, we can distribute the slides uh, to those uh, those attending or make them available. So uh, that may stimulate further questions, and uh, I certainly have further questions I'd like to uh, like to discuss with you at some point. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll draw it to a close now. Um, as I said earlier, this was the last EO Cafe before the, the summer break. We'll be back on the 9th of uh, September when we'll be talking with uh, the new kid on the block, uh, the uh, USPA. We'll have Rodrigo da Costa um, talking about his, uh, his plans and ambitions for, for the agency. Um, and then EO Cafe will continue every two weeks, uh, every Thursday afternoon at four o'clock after that. So you can set your diaries and we'll announce the program in, in due course. Um, so thank you again for everybody for joining us. Feel free just to stay on the, uh, on the call. We'll keep it open for a, a short while at least for any uh, further informal discussions with Hans or between, uh, between you. I don't know, Hans may, uh, may need to, uh, to drop out, but for everyone on the call, we, uh, we have this sort of very uh, even more informal um, part to the, the meeting. So um, I w just remains to wish everybody a very good summer break. Um, hope you managed to get away. Hope you managed to do whatever you would like to do over the summer and uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, in September. Thanks.